Well, it's kind of exciting right now because this is actually the first day in Minnesota where there's no hunting until 2021 season. And so I'm kind of excited because all summer, you know, we bought the property in June. We we're able to get in, get on here and start spraying, start, start our food plots a little bit early. But really it was all about getting stands in place, like where we shot Kermit, blinds in place, like where we shot Blade and where uh, Diane shot Wally and the other buck, we call them Iowa is what Dylan called them. So, and then Dante shot his buck about right here within 20 yards of here. So it was all about getting these blinds and stands in place where we thought we could hunt and shoot bucks. And I feel like we were really successful for the first year, really happy with the way everything turned out. What now that the season's over, instead of going in right into tree stands in locations, you guys have probably followed us on the channel a lot going back into Wisconsin. A lot of times we're, we're going back into the woods this time of year and actually filming because I could care less about spooking deer now. In fact, I could care less about spooking deer right now all the way through next August, the end of August. I really don't care because even if we have mature bucks around here right now, yeah, we might not friend their sheds because we spook them off the property. But um, at the same time, we can actually scout, look at the patterns that are happening right now. And, uh, and you can see right now, I mean, just even standing and talking out here on the food plot, it almost feels sacrilegious because um, we've been so careful about not spooking deer on the property. But you can see the feeding circles, all these dark circles. In fact, right here, here's a big Northwoods Whitetails brassica right here piece that, um, that the deer have been gnawing on. We have a lot of radishes in here and turnips and um, a really good mix from that sweet sweet feast brassica blend and you can see they're digging them up they've been digging them up uh, for the entire season they started hitting the brassicas i would say in october end of october um, you can see on this side we had rye and peas late planted beans and uh, they're not over there that much right now because they hit that early season they're mostly over on that side and then they switch later in the seed to this but the big video here and what we're looking at is how to find a buck bed. And so now we can walk into the property, which we're going to do. There's no set of ingredients. Certainly bucks want to be on a slight little rise. That could be in a flat woods, that could be a foot off the ground, just a turned up root base from a nice big hardwood. And they're just sitting on that and they have a little commanding view of that flat wood lot. Out here it might be a bench, it might be the end of a point where they have that commanding view. It's going to be dry. It might be a flat down in the bottom. There's all different places that they'll bed, but it's gonna be dry. It's gonna have a little bit of a view. There's going to be not habitat ingredients that you need to watch for. I'm not gonna say, of course they want some stem count, they wanna hide, they wanna have daytime brows, that kind of stuff. But there's no magic formula. I've seen seven successful steps to a buck bed. Just throw all that, star, that stuff out. Bucks bed by positioning. They bed by positioning to food and does. So we're starting right out here in the food. You can't have that buck bedding if you don't have this food source. Why would they be here? Why are they gonna to relate to it? Public land even, you have clear cuts. You have stands of acorns, white oaks, then red oaks, depending on where you're at. Greenbrier, down in Ohio where I hunted on public land. Deer love that in the tops, they feed on it. Maybe down in some marsh, they have some red osier dogwood. So even if you're on public land, you still find those food sources. You find the food sources, you find the does, then you find the bucks in that order. So we're out here right now. And you can see the strip of corn up towards the redneck way in the background up there. We need to secure this food plot more. We couldn't do that this year. We're adding switchgrass to this in the spring. We'll frost seed it. It's ripe for frost seeding. We'll be able to get that seed right on the soil. I don't like frost seeding on snow some people do that but i don't like doing that because especially in elevation changes if we get a fast melt that seed can wash off i'm going to get that seed on the ground when it's bare and uh and obviously after the season now we can do that i'll get that frost seed on the ground i'll use simazine before spring green up when the ground is still a little pliable but there's no green showing i'll use a combination of roundup and 2,4-D once you get two to three weeks into uh, spring green up i'll get that switchgrass established I'm looking at around the food plot. This is step number one. Step number one, we have the food. Step number two, we have the screening. I don't want to take up a lot of my food plot space. So I'm going to, I'm going to push this edge a little bit. And I want that switchgrass to come out six to eight feet at the most. What that'll do is it'll give me a screening barrier all the way around this food plot right here. And 
within two years, that'll be six to eight feet high. Some of the switchgrass we planted last year was already three to four feet high. That first year, it's not as strong. It's still a lot of times high enough to actually support rabbits, pheasants for cover during the winter time. But I really want it to be that thick base. And even just for screening, going in through the season, next year that switchgrass should be in this height right here. And that's effectively giving that screening layer. So step one, food. Step two, we have the screening layer right here. Once we have that, you know, right now, out into the food plot here, deer don't like that stress. They don't want to sit here in bed and be able to watch out into this food plot here. They don't want open winds coming across this food plot. They want to hide and they want to be behind that screening layer. Once we have that screening layer in place, that invites bedding to take place just behind the screening layer. That bedding right now might take place 75 to 100 yards in, 150 yards in. So we're effectively, even on a larger parcel size like this, we're wasting 75 to 100 yards of potential bedding cover because we don't have the screening layer right here. I hope that makes sense. What does that screening layer do? It invites does and fawns to bed closer to the food plot and that frees up space down inside the hollow or up a ridge or out back in a flat if you have flat ground. So first we have this food, then we have the screening. Then we'll get in the woods, we'll talk about where we're gonna make some cuttings. And really, you're actually focusing on doe bedding because if you don't have doe bedding, you don't have buck bedding. If you don't have a food source, you don't have doe bedding. So buck bedding comes last. There's way too much information out there about buck beds, about how to create a buck bed, how to make sure that a buck bed is bedding in this, or a buck's bedding in this location. I've even heard some habitat managers say, we'll create these conditions right here, this high hinge cut, this canopy, bedding log, all this myth stuff, and we're gonna make a, bed, a buck bed right here. If you don't have the food, you don't have the screening, you don't have the does, and you don't have that depth of cover, then you're not gonna have the buck. So that's why I'm talking about this in order. So let's go in the woods. We have food out here. We're going to put that screening layer right here. And even now you can see a lot of this goldenrod is breaking down any of the briars. We can see even with, with it all frosted, it's been really cool lately because we've had this fog and it's just coated everything. It's actually real intricate and really pretty in here. You can see on this branch how that fog, this is not snow. This is actually fog. And I don't know if Dylan could actually zoom in on this at all, but see all these little threads of fog and ice that have been created on here. See, that's just a little branch, very delicate, really pretty. It's kind of blocking our view for the day, so how rude, you know, but at the same time, have the screening. Let's go inside and I'll show you where I'm gonna make some hinge cuts and make some cuttings, also complete cuts, maybe some hinge cuts, and we'll talk about why we're gonna do both. And that's gonna set up that next layer of bedding. We'll just take a, take a little walk in here where the deer been coming. It still feels weird, you know, this is day one that we can walk in here. I don't have to worry about spooking deer, but uh, it's uh, kind of cool at the same time. And we're gonna go find some, some deer beds. They shouldn't be too far in here, but we'll locate. Here's one right here. So here, here are those first layers of bedding we're starting to find. You know, a decent bed right over here, a small one, a small one over there. So really, you know, this is that first layer right here. We're about 40 yards off the edge and that's okay, but a lot of times these beds, especially close to the food source like this, are nighttime beds. It could be daytime beds too, but you can see how the ground's starting to drop off sharply right behind me. There's a rub down in the woods, and then there's a second bench down there. And so I'm gonna talk about how we're gonna layer these, and I wanna make sure these beds are here all the time. And we're not just doing this randomly. This is on the edge of a food plot. We can't walk in and hunt here during the regular season. We'll spook bedding, we'll spook the food plot out, Maybe you can get in here safely during the middle of the day or middle of the morning or even post daybreak where we can get into a stand right here. But if we want pure bedding right here, we have to be very careful to never spook this out. So there's a pretty good section in here, about 150 yards long, that is going to be dedicated bedding right adjacent to this food plot. And we'll hunt on this end. We'll hunt on the end of a point out there. It'll be a new stand next year we'll talk about. But for right now, this is an area we're not just going randomly into the woods and saying, okay, we're going to do this to the habitat to promote bedding. It all has to relate very strategically because the worst thing we could do is put a bedding area here if we have to spook it every time we get in and out of the stand. So let's take a look a little bit further in. And you can see one bed right here. And it's hard to see in this, but this is one flat right here. It's fairly flat. It goes uphill to the food plot and then it really dips down right here. So in this area, 
if you can see that next bench down and you know what's interesting i've never even walked in here i mean this is only 40 50 yards off the edge i've never even walked in here so this is kind of cool and what's nice with all the leaves we can see the other side of our land on the other side of the draw over there so we'll talk about that in a little bit but where it flattens down right down there i would expect beds to be on that bench before it drops off again and this is what i do for a living you know when i'm on client properties 100 plus a year we're looking ahead and we're saying okay bedding should be in that location or maybe i'm just thinking it sometimes sometimes i actively talk to the client about it and then we go over there and see it and then we talk about why so we're going to go down there we'll check that bedding out see if it's there and if it's not we're going to make deer bed there next year real nice rub you kind of watch you know is it is it relating to a deer trail this way but it looks like a lot of these tracks are going straight downhill and right on this bench right back down here this is that next layer of bedding right here and you can see how they're on this flat right before it drops off so we could see this from 50 yards back and say there's probably a bedding there and you go find it now so here's bed right here another bed but there's a bed right down there too and then it drops off really steep something interesting you know people you look at these and say wow this is a really big bed must be a couple bucks but you find pellets and you get in an area like this you look for small pellets big pellets and it tells you that's a doe and a fawn or a doe family group bedding area if you're if you're really finding buck beds and you're walking across the bed out in the woods they're usually clusters where he's getting up moving around during the daytime and you'll find those single big pellets same size big track and that'll tell you that that's a buck bed but when you find these different size pellets in those areas and different size tracks it's always does and fawns and then you have another one over here it's interesting you'll see like if you watch it from a stand you'll have a doe bed here and a doe fawn bed over here and then sometimes that button buck gets stuck down there he wants to relate to his mom and his sister in this area and um but he gets pushed off to the side and a lot of times there's another small bed over here so and we did have three diane actually sat on this blind this this plot last night and there are three that came out down here so it's probably a doe fawn um button buck and then mother she's come down here and just a little bed so now I can tell you there's no beds going down. You can see where it drops off really steep. So we're on this bedding layer. We had the bedding layer up there. What I wanna do is I wanna go through here and identify trees that are junk trees that I can actually cut down. We have a shag bark hickory. Now we'll see a white oak, like this white oak over here. And it's forming okay um, we have a beautiful red oak right here that's coming in we have a decent white oak right here and then we have a lot of trash in between I want to make sure that white oak gets some sunlight I want to make sure this red oak gets some sunlight I want to make sure this white oak gets some sunlight right here so I'm gonna take a lot of these trees around here and I'm just going to hinge them if they're this size then i'm going to hinge it i want to hinge it downhill and i'm going to hinge it into this area that might be a deer trail crossing through here and there is um, but it's not bedding and it's not an area that i care to pile i can pile these trees and it's not going to hurt anything so i can work along this edge i can identify the trees that i want to protect and save if they're mature tree then i'm going to completely cut it down and that if it's hingeable tree then i'll hinge it but i want to hinge and cut these trees downhill the deer can still move up and down this ridge system and then when you get on the top side of these cuttings they can move back and forth on this area that's a little bit more of a flat before it drops down and all the way through here so i'm making a layer of cutting i might cut 20 feet deep all the way through here so this cutting as it complements the bedding i'm going to make it might be cut for 150 to 200 yards pretty easy cutting so i'm identifying trees that i can actually drop easily downhill i'm either hinging or complete cutting 
if someone says that hinge cut's not a tool or a good thing to do, they don't really know what they're talking about. And then you have trees you're gonna just cut and, and leave. There's no one size fits all. We have lots of different size trees here. So the size of the tree is going to dictate the cutting more than the type of the tree. I don't really care if I'm cutting a, a small uh, white oak. I see a skinny white oak down there that's starving. And it's, it's trying to get some sunlight. There's a bent one down there that's trying to get some sunlight. Um, and and just because it's a white oak doesn't mean I'm not going to cut it down. If it's not ever going to form into a quality white oak, where it's going to be that, that future dominant tree, then I'm going to get rid of it. And, uh, and so have some beautiful red oaks in here that were untouched. And that's a good thing along this along this ridge line. So I'm cutting trees downhill. That creates the bedding here. I'm doing the same right up there. You can look uphill and you can see where that flattens out again. That's where we found the first beds. And then you come down here, you step down, you find the next bed. So I'm also making a cutting layer up there. I don't really care if these deer go left or right through here, up and down. I just want them here. You know, and I want them to relate to that food source up there. I want to pile these deer in. And what that does, now that we have food up there, we put that first screening layer there. The deer feel very comfortable under that screening layer. That means we can walk across the food plot during the middle of the day to get, get a card, or maybe sit on a stand where we're gonna sit midday and watch a water hole with our scent blown back into the food plot. Or we can go by the food plot up top on the complete opposite side where we have, uh, where we'll have switchgrass up there where the corn's at right now. We have switchgrass there, switchgrass here, and these deer bedded in here. If we're going back out late morning, or going out at two in the afternoon for an afternoon sit, we're not gonna spook these deer back here in any way at all. It also stops that wind from advancing across that food plot. So the deer are insulated, they have that thermal protection of the switchgrass. They're not necessarily bedding in the switchgrass. That establishes that first layer of pr protection. Then we have the slope, then we have the flat where they bed. And this is no different than if you have a flat woods, then you're making that first cutting 50 yards in, 30 yards in, you have that switchgrass layer. You could actually make the cuttings right after the switchgrass so deer could bed closer to that switchgrass and still have regen, hardwood regeneration to feed on during the day. Then you make that next layer 40, 50 yards back, 30 yards, then you make that next layer. And that's what we're doing here, whether it's using these slopes or you have a flat ground. And it's no different if you're on public land and you're finding those beds, you're actually identifying the food source and then you're finding where those does bed first and then those bucks of bed behind that. You know, it's interesting, the UP in Michigan, where there's a lot of baiting. You know, when I was up there, 95% of the hunters baited, and nothing wrong with that. But what was interesting about that, a lot of times those does are bedding about 200 yards behind the bait piles or back into the woods if there's enough cover and it went back into public land, for example, it was real remote. And then you find those bucks are bedding a quarter mile to a half mile after that, and if they had that cover. So it's interesting that if they have the space, they'll take that distance. And those first, that first layer of does was 200 yards. They heard those hunters when they drove their four wheelers in, when they came and baited, they'd hear them in and out every single time. And that's why a lot of times they're not coming in until right after dark here. These deer can freely go out on that food plot back and forth. We're not spooking them. Because we have the food up there, because we have that first layer of screening, we have that second layer of bedding. We'll make a cutting along that ridge running parallel to the food source. We'll drop down the slope, we'll make another cutting right here, and we'll show those cuttings in the future. Um, we're, we're just not doing that today. Then we have this slope right here. So what does that do? It could be that the second layer, we don't have a lot of does around here, which is a good thing, but it could be that the does are bedding up there, the bucks are bedding right here, or some of them. But there's a really nice flat down below, and that's where our next round of cutting is going to take place. I want to get enough trees down on that flat, get some good canopy down where we get sunlight into that flat. There's hardwood regeneration there. And if we have does bedded here, a mix of does bedding, bucks bedding on this layer, guess what beds down there for sure. And that's where we had a picture of Negan in the early season, September. When he was here, he left about then and got shot about two miles away. Happened to a good person, so that I hear. I've never met him, so that was good that, uh, that he got him. But definitely that bedding down there. And that's what this property is really lacking is, yeah, there's a lot of frost right now, but it's still, we can, I can see all the way to the bottom. And then on the other side of the draw right there, we own that too. And we have food, food sources up along this top at the same level and elevation as this. So kind of imagine those does being spread out all the way around this rim. 
the bucks, some does spread on that second layer and definitely that bottom down there. Why would does and fawns go all the way down the bottom and all the way back up top every single day to their food source? They won't, they want to bed right up here. Those are those layers. And because we have that space, and if the property ended down there in that bottom, and maybe there's an access road, well then everything gets sandwiched in here on this slope. Then you have does bedded up top, you really have to put those layers in maybe 15 yards apart, 20 yards apart, 30 instead of every 40 yards or 30 yards. You're, you're layering those cuttings a lot closer so you, you try to compact that same amount of movement into a small area. We have more space so we can take it. People say bucks bed high, bucks bed low. Really depends on food. If there's food up there, then those bucks are not gonna bed high here. That's a big myth that bucks will bed in that top third, that top 25%. If someone says that, just completely ignore that. If food was down at the bottom and food was right there, then the bucks would bed in this middle layer. Because we have food up there, bucks are gonna bed down in the bottom. Now why you imagine this flipped around? Imagine that we own this hillside and it goes all the way up and all the way back down the other side. We have food in the bottom then would be up top here and then it goes uphill. Then those bucks would be bedded up on top because the food's down the bottom. I see that in a lot of the, the areas around here in the bluff country areas where Wisconsin, Minnesota, where you have the ag laying down the bottom of the valleys. That means you need to make that layer around the food source, which could be the ag field. Then that middle bench, that third bench, that first bench, second bench, whatever it might be. And then the top, you make those bedding layers. And now you dictate that instead of those does having to go all the way up to the top of the finger ridge that comes down between the ag field and there's no room left over for bucks, then you're putting those does and fawns down towards that base layer of food that second bench and then that top of the ridge could be for bucks then and that's what we're doing in reverse here so always think where the food's at so whether you're looking for buck beds on public land whether you're creating buck beds on private land always consider these layers and dylan and i have like five six seven videos that we're going to shoot today we're going to shoot a lot of videos today and then we're going to hunt tomorrow and then i have clients and i'm going to wednesday thursday friday i have a day off i'm going to hunt on saturday sunday i drive down to indianapolis area have two clients and then uh the following week after that next week i have five clients in six days something like that in ohio so this is a start of my client season and it's a start of me scouting buck beds a hundred times on properties in different states and locations Pretty easy to see even today. I've never literally stepped foot in this area. In fact, I keep looking at this deer trail down here and I wanna go down there and I love deer trails. I love, you know, understanding why they're there. It's, it's this last little bench area that they can actually step on before dropping off the side. We're not gonna drop off the side because we have too much work to do today for videos, but this is a pretty hard trail right here. And this is one of those trails that maybe we find some sheds on. We find some old rubs right here. Here's an example of a white oak. It's white oak right here, right here. And these white oaks, because of the mature timber around them and because they're really starving for the sun, they're real subordinates, they're gonna be leaners. They'll probably, if we leave this mature timbered here, they're gonna die. I'm gonna take out these young white oaks, drop them downhill, that allow sunlight to come in here. It'll accent and really define the bedding where Dylan's at with the camera right now. And then we have that next layer up there and then up. I would say to the food source right now, we're about 80, about 100 yards off the food edge. So we're down to this layer and you can bet there's some really good beds down in the bottom in that flat that'll be bucks. And we're gonna try to stuff a lot more habitat in here. And ultimately we're, what we're giving them is a lot of daytime browse, regeneration, briars. And I love red cedar for this area for bedding. And so my goal in the spring is I'm gonna dot these cuttings especially the dead tops of the complete cuts, not the hinge cuts. I'm gonna stick those red cedars back in there. Deer don't really browse on those red cedars too often at all. So I'll be able to fill this side right here with some red cedar. We'll further diversify the bedding by adding that conifer, conifer layer. Always remember there's four components of bedding. You have weeds, briars, grasses, shrubs, hard regeneration, and conifers. I started writing about that 10 years ago, first wrote about it in Quality Whitetails about 10 years ago at least. And, um, and those are those four components of bedding. 
the more we can stick into this location, the more attractive it is. We have a lot of attraction to change. I can see that way. I can see some snow back there at about 200 yards. I mean, it's really, really open in a lot of areas. And we have some of this ground cover right here, but boy, it gets really open down there. I'm sure we've pushed a lot of deer out of here today, but uh, I'm excited. I just like looking at the views and coming in here. And, you know, we had a lot of leaves on these, on these trees during the summertime. And we were specifically looking for areas that we could actually kill deer from for stand locations. Now we're getting into the meat of the property and we're gonna have a lot of cutting going forward. We'll show you that. But that's how you find a buck bed. You have to find these layers first, whether it's on public land or private land you're creating it. You have to have these steps. The bucks will fall in line, especially if we have does up there. Bucks are gonna be back here. They're not gonna bed in between the does and their food source. That's how you find a buck bed. Try it, look out on public land, private land. Always be looking ahead and saying, I bet you they're bed bedding right there. You can confirm what you've learned, take it to the field, and you'll be a better hunter for this fall. Now, as we transition into habitat season, I hope you've had a chance to check out my web class, how to design your web, your whitetail parcel. It's on my website, whitetailhabitatsolutions.com. I have a link in the description, and I hope you can find it, check it out, and enjoy it this year.